Hello everybody, welcome back. Drawing together, uh, we have a, a, an exciting one today. Um, as I've been chatting with a few of you as we kind of kicked off the, um, the event that, uh, you know, there's a, a desire to, um, to work in color. Uh, so to, today, I, I'm going to try to give that a shot, see if I can work in maybe a pastel demo at some point. Um, but I think this is a really good way to get us into that point. So if you're new and you're joining us, this is Drawing Together. I'm Scott with Artist Network and our... Oh, do I, is there no sound? This audio seems to be working all right. If somebody can um, confirm... Uh, is anybody else having sound issues? So if we are, I'm not sure what that is. Um, all right, well, I, I'm assuming that, we, that everything is working all right. Um, Jenna, if you're still having issues, oh, we're doing, let me try this again. Okay, sound is good, excellent. I'm gonna adjust things a little bit, okay. Perfect. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what we can do about working with pastel. In the meantime, what we're working on today is this landscape. Um, if you're following along, you'll find the reference image in the link below. And um, I'm working in charcoal for this one. And the reason I am is because you can see how dark we need to get for this one. Um, this is all about value here and doing a value study. I took this reference photo. This is right outside Fort Collins in a little town called Timnath, uh, just uh, east of town. And so we're looking out at Long's Peak and the foothills there as the sun is setting. Um, I saw this spot. I thought, well, maybe this will work as a, a painting. Um, so I thought, well, why don't I try a value study first and then and then and see how it works out. Um, and I, I found that this was. Um, there's a lot more to this and I really kind of anticipated. I do landscape so much um, that I kind of forget um, about uh, some of the, the nuances and the things that are really valuable and, and, and val valuable in this exercise and how it's a little bit, little bit different than working with still lives or figures or singular objects that we have been working with. So um, this is a little bit larger paper. It's about 11 and a half by 16 and a half. This is a Hanamula paper that I'm working on. It's, it's pretty smooth, but it accepts the, uh, the charcoal pretty well. Um, and, and so into the materials, um, I've got my shading stump, I've got my vine charcoal and I have a compressed charcoal stick. This compressed charcoal is what I'm going to be, um, really getting those deep values in with. And I also have my charcoal pencils. These are four B's. So relatively soft, but not nearly as soft as this compressed charcoal that I have. This is a Richardson brand um, charcoal that is, I, I really love how rich and deep that gets. And of course I have my kneaded eraser, my rubber eraser. These are well used now. So I've been using the same kneaded eraser the entire series. We're in episode 33, I think. So we've been doing this for quite a while um, and it seems to be still working. So, um, oh, as you can note, as you, can probably tell I'm in a new space. I recently moved over the weekend, still in Colorado here, um, but I'm enjoying this new space that I have set up. So we're gonna get into it. Um, the first thing that I wanna do is get rid of this light. So with this one, it's all about creating that luminosity where the sun is setting against the foothills. Um, and what I love about working with the landscape is that it allows me to get kind of loose, more expressive, um, and and, and more atmospheric. You know, these everything in this landscape, um, they, there's a variety of edges. There's some really soft, very hard. Um, there are um, lots of, um, there's a, just a range of, of shapes and forms uh, that, that work together to create this. And so for this, it's gonna be all about value. And, and it offers me a bit of freedom and flexibility um, in terms of uh, some of the proportions. I'm, I'm thinking about the whole space um, not just a singular object the way I have, I have been in so many of the videos in this series. Uh, if you are new to this, uh, this series, welcome. Um, you can find more information on artistnetwork.com. I have the Drawing Together page uh, there where you'll, there's a link in the description. Um, and I've been seeing a lot of viewers posting work created throughout the series um, that um, it's just been awesome to see. So thank you all for doing that. Um, as you can see, what I'm doing is kind of working my way from the outside in. I'm going to move these guys over here. Um, I, I chose to work on a bigger piece of paper just to give myself a little bit more um, room for kind of physical expression. I can move my body a bit more, and I really enjoy that. 
Um, so I'm just using the, the charcoal on its side. This is a soft vine charcoal, um, and I'm just kind of creating this, this halo around where I anticipate the, the, the brightest lights to be, gradually, gradually getting a little bit lighter as we move into the center, wiping it down with my hand here. I'm going to have to just hold these in my left hand. There we go, so I can get down in here. Uh, and I'm not too worried about keeping this area where the highlight's going to be perfectly light, uh, perfectly white. Um, but I am trying to try to think about where that light is emanating from. So this is all about building the landscape from the light. And I'm just kind of blocking in some of these values here. And I can start to uh, lay out the basic uh, elements in here just to make sure that I'm giving myself enough room here. Try to visualize this Long's Peak here. Moving my eyes quickly back and forth between the reference image and uh, the drawing. And what I, re what I really love about this scene is what happens here along the horizon line uh, where we have that sky that is, that is, again, softer. We can see the clouds in it, of course, and there are objects there, but it's, um, all those objects are very kind of soft and atmospheric. And then as we come down to the horizon line, we get that sharp edge, and it kind of comes in and out of that atmosphere. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I love the way that it, it allows us to kind of focus on uh, certain objects uh, gives our uh, gives our eyes a place to focus and rest for a bit. Uh, so one of the things to observe, especially around where the sun is setting, is the clouds are building, and uh, they get a little bit darker in there. So I can start to map out where these darker forms will be, and I'm letting my eyes be really soft and focus. I'm not thinking about uh, kind of sharp focus at this point squinting a lot, letting my eyes blur. Uh, and I, I kind of talked a bit about this in one of the previous uh, episodes, but um, I do a lot of um, kind of fluctuating between squinting and then opening my eyes really wide and letting it lose focus. So it's, it's limiting light and then flooding it with light um, to see how it changes my interpretation of the scene. Um, and I, I feel like that alternating um, between that, between squinting and, and, and flooding, uh, helps me to get a better understanding of really what's happening. Um, they they kind of balance each other out and uh, into a um, an understanding of really what our eyes do when they're at rest. And so you can you can kind of start to see uh, subtle indications of rays coming out of the the sun, uh, you know, the spot of the sun here, um, and. That's something that I want to try to uh, be aware of as we go through the drawing. Um, one of the things also I love about this is that I want to capture the feeling of the scene, not necessarily get every cloud right. Um, and some of these clouds I almost feel are, it almost feels overwhelming with so much information. And when, as I did my preparatory one that you saw at the beginning of the video, I felt like it got really muddy in here. And I may play around with that um, and start to eliminate some of the... Uh, some of the clouds in there. And so as you can see, I'm doing all my drawing using the side of the pencil. I'm holding it, or not the pencil, the, uh, the, um, the vine charcoal. I'm holding it just kind of in the middle and giving myself the opportunity to just make marks on the page and let them kind of, uh, let it do its own thing to some degree. Um, if you have any questions, uh, oh, Judy asking if you can use it for an oil painting. Absolutely. So this is a this is a um, this is a reference photo that I took myself. Go right ahead. I'm not worried about that. Um, I don't know as if I'm going to actually create a painting out of this or not. We're, we're going to see, but um, I took several on this from this spot here, and I this was probably about a month or so ago that I took this photo, um, and I feel like this it's. Um, as I look at this, I go by the spot frequently. As I look at the spot, I, I kind of like what's happening as the, um, 
as the summer progresses, as the days get longer and the sun is at a, in a different spot in the sky um, as it sets. So, so again, I'm just kind of thinking through um, the overall scene. I am just getting rid of that white. And this is a, very similar to how I would construct a, an oil painting or a pastel. Try to be thinking about it in this way. Um, now, kind of going into the topic of color, um, you know, one of the, the one of the real challenges and the benefits to working in black and white in a landscape is it really forces you to confront the issue of value. Um, in that, in the, in the landscape, when you're working with color, you can often use the color um, variation to define the, the an edge. Um, and it's often very difficult to determine what the value relationship is. And so I want to kind of explain what that means a little bit. As, I, as I'm going through here, what I'm doing is this is some of the compressed charcoal. I want to get a little bit darker here on the, on the, the ground plane along that horizon line here just to help me see the context of the, that light there. So right away, I've got a strong contrast between dark and light. Um, and then from here, I can start to massage the values. But um, going back to what I was just talking about in terms of color contrast, if you look at this in the sky, in a lot of these areas, um, especially like here in the clouds, we can see it gets a little bit darker in here, but that sky is relatively dark as well. Um, there's really more of a temperature shift happening there than a value shift. It gets a little bit darker in here, but a lot of these values in, this, in the clouds are warm um, against kind of a cooler, bluer sky behind it. So, but the value relationship is very similar. As we move down to the horizon where we get that nice orange light, uh, we have to, uh, again, interpret that color difference as a value. Uh, and that can be sometimes really helpful when working in color because what I tend to do and the, the thing that I struggle with most in landscape painting is when I see something that's bright and intense, I go right for the white um, instead of a, you know, really the hue. And so as, if I can see it as a value first, I know that, that that color that I'm mixing has to be a certain value and then I can increase the saturation to create the impression of light rather than going for white. So when you add white to a color, it lightens its value but it actually lowers the saturation and you're gonna get a brighter, more intense color if you go for color and saturation over value. Um, so I just want to uh, just double check there this before I get too far, see if there's any questions. If you do have any questions, feel free to shout them out in all caps. Um, I see some questions. Uh, everybody have the materials list and the um, the reference photo, I hope. So, all right. So I'm just kind of, you can see that I'm just kind of, Blocking in some of these values as I squint, this is essentially what I'm seeing. I'm trying to build these forms on the value relationships, not differentiate objects at this point. And so, what one of the things I can start to observe here is and again the rays kind of radiate out from that sun, that from the, the center of, of, of the sun. There, um, we have clouds that are generally horizontal in nature. Um, but the, these rays that kind of radiate out from that, uh, from the sun. And so I want to be aware of both of those dynamics in, in the drawing. And hopefully I'll be able to art, kind of articulate that as we go. So I'm just taking my shading stump here. And what I'm going to do is actually kind of start in that background um, and try to refine this. This is going to be the, the area of interest in the... Um, in the drawing, otherwise known as kind of the focal point. Um, it's not specifically a point because it's taking up this whole area, but um, I'm going to be kind of thinking about this and then kind of working my way out. So a little bit different than we've approached some of the uh, some of the other drawings here in the in the series. I think what I need to do is actually take this vine charcoal. So as you can see, I haven't even gone to the compressed charcoal pencil at this point. Um, it's, it's all been the vine charcoal and the stick. 
things that don't give me a whole lot of control in terms of line work. I haven't drawn any outlines. I'm thinking more about it in terms of shape. And you can see I'm just kind of tapping as I go along. And so I, I think for me this is a real benefit to working in landscape and, and drawing because it, it does offer opportunities to uh, experiment with the marks that you make with your materials. Uh, often when we work with uh, portraits, still lifes, kind of working on defined objects, uh, we can kind of get locked into a series of specific marks you know, that, that we go to all the time. Um, and this allows us to kind of experiment with new ways of working. One of the things that I'm doing is an, it's a bit of a no-no right now is I'm using my oily fingertips <laughs> to blend. And I know, uh, you know, those of you who've been with the, the series for a while, I've talked about that a lot and I broke my rule. And I can see some marks in here that are just, that's, that, there's this dark mark in here. Um, it caught more because my fingers were oily as I did this. And so that's what was happening. So I need to use, I'm gonna use the palm of my hand to blend a bit more. Uh, and I apologize for dropping into the shot. I'm gonna to try to do my best to keep my head out of the shot. With a new camera set up here, it's a little bit closer, but it's more squared up over the image and I find myself leaning into it uh, perhaps too much. All right, so I need to, you know, one of the things to remember too that, you know, when you were, when you're working with the sky, the sky, it just seems to be filled with light. Um, you know, and of course the sun is the brightest spot, but even as we look in this area in here, there's a, it's catching a fair amount of light. Look at that. Um, and uh, I need to try to interpret that specific value. So what I'm actually gonna do is try to work on creating a bit of a a solid gradient, not a solid gradient, a gradient, but a, a kind of smooth gradient across the, um, up, up the sky. So as we go from the horizon to, uh, you know, the top of the sky here, it gradually gets darker. Uh, and it, there's a kind of a shift in uh, color as well. If you are new to, new to landscape painting, one of the, uh, one of the things that can be really enlightening is uh, to study the gradient, the sky transition, the gradient from the horizon uh, to, the, to the, the top of the sky there. Um, not only in terms of value, but in terms of color and temperature. So as you go from the horizon up, you see a temperature shift, um, gradually getting um, kind of more violet at the top, uh, more kind of a, a cooler blue towards the middle. And as you come down, it tends to neutralize. It becomes a bit more gray. Um, sometimes it's warm. Um, and, and, and what I love about that is that that varies depending on your location. So when I lived in Maine, that gradient was slightly different than what it was when I lived in Alaska. And then now I'm down here in Colorado where it's different again as well, just because of the different particulates in the atmosphere. You see a shift in from winter to uh, summer as well as, um, as there can be more, um, more or less uh, um, water in the, uh, in the sky. You know, so in the winter, especially in Alaska and Maine, it would get really crystal clear and that, that sky would change blue slightly. And so as I'm doing this, one of the things I'm looking for, are just kind of light spots and I can kind of fill it in and rub it down so like that. So starting just to build up that, that gradient here, just kind of smoothing it out. Um, I kind of have myself an anchor here looking at the, that primary focal point. And I can come back in and start to massage it a little bit more. Um, I'm just reading your comment here. It seems in every season that you're always drawn from inside out instead of outlining anything. I would like to try the approach with painting sometime. When can we paint? <laughs> Love your style, excellent. Well, I'll work on that, see if I can get it set up to, a, to perhaps demonstrate a, a painting. Um, and you know, when, when painting, it's, it's tricky because when I'm on location, sometimes I don't have really the luxury of um, working the way I would wanna work. 
Um, what I mean by that is like sometimes you just have to capture something because it's it's happening right there. So if I were painting the sunset on location, uh, that is happening very, very quickly. And so what I tend to do in that situation is I try to predict what is what is transitory and what's going to be more fixed. Uh, so for example, that value on the ground stays relatively the same for a fair amount of time. That sun, as it drops down, that changes a lot. So what I, I, might, what I might have to do is capture that one area quickly, lock that, and then come back to, say, the ground plane, something that is um, going to be more consistent over time. Or sometimes I may be working on the ground plane and then the sun gets right into the spot I want it and I have to quickly capture that and then I can go to the other part of the painting. Um, and so I, what I, and if I have plenty of time, it, ideally this is how I would tackle a painting. But like I said, when you're on location, you may not have that, that luxury. I'm just kind of building up some of this, but but Cynthia, you're you're right in terms of trying to think in terms of shape rather than line, and especially in the landscape, it can help with that. What that does is it helps you to capture that whole space rather than thinking about individual objects. Um, the the line defines it's it, it's a symbol for an edge, so it defines an edge, and typically when we as viewers confront a line, our brain says, oh, that, that's where the edge of an object is, and we're going to um, switch to something new now. Um, and, and so if we, if we build a landscape, especially with, with too much line, then it can often become flat. So if you go back, the, very, the second um, video I did in this whole series was a, a landscape drawn in line. Um, and that was a bit of a challenge, and it really didn't capture a whole lot of depth or space, that, but that was the intent to really see how far we could push line. Can we, cr can we create a sense of depth and atmosphere using line work? And a lot of that was helping to work out proportions, things like that. Um, but if you, if you compare that drawing to this, this is hopefully going to have a lot more um, kind of life and color. Uh, not color, but a uh, value, light to it. All right, so what I need to do here is I can see some light clouds in this area, um, and so I need to have a enough of a tone established, and I can erase out those, high, those, those light clouds there. And so, so much of this is about actually going darker um, in certain areas in order to create the contrast that we need. And that's where starting with that toned paper can be helpful. And, and again, I'm not, um, I'm not really locking anything down. I'm not drawing individual objects. It's more about general shapes and values. So if you are a landscape painter, I think uh, you know, it's, it's really helpful to, uh, to work in these value studies. Uh, you see some great uh, painters create a, um, you know, just a black and white study of the, um, of the scene, uh, forgetting the term for that right now, when it's purely just black and white. Um, but you'll see different artists taking different approaches. You know, some will do a, you know, purely black and white, um, purely black and white study. Some will do break it down into three main values. Some will draw just the shape of the shadow and the shape of the light. Um, to understand that, and you're going to find what works best for you. Kind of just, again, moving my way around the drawing, trying not to get locked into any single spot too long. So again, trying to hold in my mind here, this, this is a good cloud to, to confront that idea that I was talking about earlier, that the cloud has kind of a horizontal nature to it, but also a... Um, there are these kind of diagonal rays that kind of cut through. Yeah, Amanda, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just reading your comment, Amanda, yelling at that your, your OCD is yelling at use a paper towel, it oil ruins the texture of the paper. Exactly. I. 
but I love drawing with my fingers. And for me, oops, excuse me, uh, for me, sacrificing that, um, you know, when I, you know, running the risk of creating kind of an oily, you know, blotches on the paper is worth it to have that tactile sense. Um, and it, to me, I, I, there's just so much drawing that happens with the fingers. And I, you know, I, I don't get an opportunity to do this with oil paints. I just, I, I don't trust the, uh, the chemicals in the oil paints. You know, so many oil paints are, are made from uh, minerals um, and elements that are poisonous. Cobalt, for example, you know, cadmiums you don't want, uh, you don't want in your bloodstream. So I, I don't use my fingers intentionally when I paint. You know, I often am not as careful as I should be, but um, there's just something really tactile about charcoal that I thoroughly enjoy, and I'm willing to sacrifice the uh, the potential for for this drawing to get kind of blotchy. So it's going to happen. But I think you're right. So if, you know, if you're looking for something that's kind of cleaner, more controlled, a paper towel, a shading stump, things like that, can be more effective. But you can see how soft and atmospheric this is. Again, I'm just kind of floating around. I'm feeling confident in the value down in here, so I don't really have to do much. I can come back through and clean that up a little bit later. I can see some scratches on the paper that were caused by the, um, by the charcoal. Actually, I'm going to start to bring up some of these, some of the charcoal up there. So I'm just picking up some charcoal with my fingers, drawing, and this is where my students, <laughs> my students would often uh, really struggle when they would see me do this. They're like, I don't like the charcoal or some, you know, I get some students that just love it and they would love to make a mess. And then others that would, you know, vehemently object to this. And that's totally fine. Um, it's not for everybody, but I love it. Um, so yeah, you could be. I could be using a paper towel right now, and if you don't like the, you know, what's what's happening, if your fingers are getting all dirty, then um, you know, just use a paper towel, and you can kind of simulate exactly what I'm doing here. So hopefully, then what you're seeing is what I'm seeing, which is kind of a. It's almost like I'm looking through the scene um, as as though it's you know through multiple layers of fog, or I'm looking at it through you know, kind of fr frosted lenses. And, um, and th this is all really an exercise. I'm not creating this drawing as an object that I'm gonna be hanging on the wall. I'm not going to be, you know, selling this or anything like that. This is purely an exercise for me. Um, if I was creating something for, for sale, I would, I would then actually avoid using my fingers. Those oils could affect the paper over time, uh, and I would worry about the archival nature of it, but because this is an exercise, I'm not worried about it, and I need to get dirty for me to draw with charcoal. And that's what I love. Again, I, I chose a larger piece of paper so that I can get into the drawing. I can, um, can move my body. Uh, when I'm painting, it's kind of the same way. I like to use the whole arm, Use my, you know, use as much of my kind of torso, my shoulders, my arms, as much as as I can. Um, it becomes a very physical experience. Uh, but that's just me, um, you know. I start to feel kind of claustrophobic when I uh, when I try to create too. Much. So I'm just kind of kind of blending in around the edges here. It's kind of creating this vignette that I kind of like. And it, and it simulates that, um, that, that light and hopefully it's, ex it's expressing the light right now. So, and, um, you know, some of you are noting that, I mean, you could potentially leave this as it is, you know, it captures the light. And then it, the, the, the approach that I like to take, and this is what I was kind of taught in college, it really resonated with me, was the idea of bringing up the whole drawing as, at once. So at any point you could essentially stop and you could say, I, I understand what this is. Um, and and that's that's really the approach I'm taking. Uh, so I'm just kind of lightly washing over this, and I'm going to try to create even 
finer hot spot right here where the sun is stronger. So this is just my kneaded eraser. Trying to pull out some of the highlights here. And I'm gonna use my shading stump. I'm just gonna pick up some charcoal. I'm just kind of essentially loading my shading stump with, with charcoal right now. And I can start to render some of these clouds in here. And I wanna pay attention to what clues I'm getting in the reference photo about where sharper edges exist and where softer edges exist. And so um, that's really more of what I'm thinking about right now than specific shapes. You know, I've got everything very soft right now, but I'm gonna try to see like where, where do I sense and where do I observe harder, more defined shapes. So one of the things I'm doing with my shading stump is I'm gradually rolling it. Um, you know, it's got, there's more charcoal in some areas, there's less in others. And I'm kind of gradually rolling it to find an area that has kind of more charcoal when it seems to run out. So I'm gonna add, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time in this area than perhaps other areas, uh, building my way out from that center of interest. Um, and looking at the dark, so I haven't really gone back in and, and pulled out any of the lights. Um, there's, gonna, there's, some, there's some light clouds in there, but I wanna get some of these darker values in first, I think. Uh, so, and in, in still my eyes are really out of focus right now, and they only come into focus kind of momentarily to orient myself. All right, I'm gonna check to see if there's any questions real quick. Um, All right, Nia, I'm glad to hear that these videos are working for you. I get a lot of positive, positive feedback. I always welcome suggestions. As you know, I think, um, you know, one of the things I'd like to, do, to define this series by is the idea that, it, you know, art is a collaborative, can be a collaborative process. We spend so much time when we're working often just kind of in our own heads and it becomes a solitary thing. Um, but I think I've, I've learned so much um, from, working with other people and, 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 and gathering observations that you know, I, I think it's really awesome to see happen in this group as well. Um, I, it, by my, in my nature, I prefer to work alone, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, which is not uncommon, uh, as uh, you know, I'm sure many of you are the same way, but I, I found that I, my work became rather stagnant after a while of so many years just kind of working on my own and then in my job here at artist network uh, i get the opportunity to you know create videos with some amazing uh, artists and talent from all over the world um, and you know seeing that power of of feedback and in the form of observations how do you how do you see it as an artist uh, what are you seeing happening um, uh, I've learned so much. And so what I really enjoy seeing in this group is that you are all really um, supportive and positive in your comments and, and, and helpful in providing your observations, what's working, what's not working, what could be improved upon. Um, I'm here to, to do this as an exercise and hopefully you are as well, that I, I, this is all to help me become a better painter, a better artist, um, and having a community of people that you trust for, your, uh, for their uh, observations is really helpful. And I, I really enjoy that I can trust you all um, with that. So, um, so that goes with, you know, not only the, the artwork itself, but, you know, the, the series, you know, getting a lot of positive feedback, um, what could be improved, what other you know, subjects to work on, things like that. So I want to thank you all. 
I love in this area here that it gets really kind of soft and atmospheric. You know, so as a, as a landscape painter, I went through this phase. Actually, no, I wouldn't say it's a phase. I spent most of my early career really thinking about sharp edges throughout the entire painting um, uh, rather than a kind of subtle atmosphere shift, atmospheric shifts and gradients. Um, and that's because my, my hero, my, my, I think my number one influence, Neil Welliver, was able to create a sense of depth and atmosphere in a, in a way uh, through a style that um, used kind of sharply defined edges throughout the entire painting. He created this tension between um, all the paint sitting on the surface and the, um, and the, the depth and atmosphere created through the, the precise um, selection of color, the precise mixing of color. And that I was just, it always, that just blew my mind that he was able to do that. And so as a result, I did a lot of kind of hard edges, edges in my painting. Um, and I kind of lost a sense of depth. I just wasn't able to achieve what he did. Uh, so then I kind of shifted and I started creating things that just building up soft transitions in value and then gradually just pulling out um, sharp detail um, in certain areas. Uh, and that seemed to, to, to work for me. So I think, you know, give it a, you know, play around with different ways of um, dealing with edges in your work. See what works for you. There's kind of like this zigzaggy thing happening here. It gets really difficult to see what's going on in this area. And so rather than really try to lock it in and be completely precise with the proportions, I'm just going to try to become more gestural with it and um, more suggestive of that form and value. Um, one of the things that I, as I work on landscapes, I, I try to, I try to identify what needs to be um, precisely rendered, wh where, where I need to have exact proportions and where I can be more flexible. Um, when I'm painting a mountain, for example, it's important for me to be that, for that mountain to be correct in terms of its proportions. To me, it's like a portrait when I'm painting a mountain. I want to do a portrait of that mountain. It's got to be that mountain specifically. Um, and, but I can be more loose with the skies. I can be expressive with that because that's constantly changing. Whereas the shape of the mountain, the profile, is fixed. Um, you know, some artists that I work with use, use that as, um, as kind of suggestions in the work rather than um, kind of hard and fast rules. So they may look at the a rough shape of the mountain and then uh, use it as a... Uh, kind of a jumping off point to adjust the proportion, I mean, the, the composition to suit the needs of the composition. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of saying that putting that out there for you to decide for yourself where, where you want to go with um, with that. And so like, in the, like I said, in the sky for me, I, I can, I feel like I can be loose and more expressive and allow the, the painting and the drawing to do what it does. But when I get down to the peak, I want to be more precise. And it's going to happen down in here. I haven't quite got to that part yet. I think I want to stay in the sky for now because I've captured, I think I've got the value, the general values enough down here that I can, um, I don't have to worry about anything down there. It's not going to, as I change this, it's not going to affect the sky. So I can be comfortable uh, working here, here in the sky. If I didn't have that in there, this is where I would, I would need to make sure that that, the value relationships are established by working in that, that ground plane a little bit more. Um, I'm missing some comments here. Um, I, I see a bunch came in as I got kind of consumed by my, my thoughts there. So I hope I didn't miss any, any uh, specific Oh, okay. Um, I see this question. Can you please explain the benefit of shading first instead of first drawing the figures? Um, the so that is a really good question, um, and you may find benefit in looking back at some of the other um, uh, some of the other the drawings in the series uh, to see how that plays out in other subjects as well. But what happens is. By, by drawing this way and thinking in terms of value and shape first, I ensure that everything is unified by the light. And then the forms can build within that. Because sometimes what can happen when I draw an outline of things first and then add the values, 
those outlines are they define uh, the the edges of an object. Um, and so by its nature, by having a lot of lines on the page, the brain thinks of all of those lines as being different things. So you're starting from a point of difference and then you're trying to unify it with value. Starting this way without the lines, you're starting from a point where everything is unified and then you're gradually creating differentiation by adding the line work. So ho hopefully that makes sense. I, 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 it's something that I confront a lot in this series um, in, in just about every subject, but um, in particular, if you look at the um, the early still life ones that I did in the series, like the the um, with the oranges and the eggs, um, I I go into further explanation of that. But that's really what I'm thinking about: is that lines create in the mind an understanding of the and that, that an object is ending, as the edge of an object, and and then and there's a likelihood then that it we're creating separation on the page. I want to start with unity and then find differentiation. Uh, so one of the things too that we observe in the sky is to think about the sky as a ceiling, not a wall, right? So it's not something that's just back there, but it starts back there and it comes up and over us. Um, and as a result, um, we have a change in perspective. The clouds above, we're looking up at more. As we come down, we're looking across at them. And so as we look on the horizon line, the clouds there may be significantly larger than what's in the foreground, but because we're looking across at them, they really condense on the page into something that's, that's smaller. So uh, as, I, as I work down the horizon line, I'm thinking more about these thinner marks um, thinking about kind of squishing everything a bit more in there. Um, and then kind of going back to the idea of the line versus value is as, as a value study for a, a landscape, if I'm going to go back in and paint this, uh, working this way um, approximates more closely what would happen with a brush. Uh, you know, so when I, when I paint, I, you know, the brush lends itself to thinking in terms of shape rather than line, and so I'll often start this way as well. All right, so now I'm gonna go back in. Now I've got things roughly working here. I wanna to start to define some of the, uh, the clouds in here. I can start to think about some of the lighter clouds, and so using the kneaded eraser, I can start to lift in, lift out some of these, these clouds here starting to create some definition. And now, um, one of the things I wanna also wanna be mindful of is, is the value shift from that center outward. As we move out, there are some areas that are a little bit lighter, but they're not quite as light as what's happening here. So I need to be very gentle with my, um, with the touch on the, the kneaded eraser. And where I need it a little bit lighter, I can kind of, I can um, press down a little bit harder And so what I'm looking for is, is you know, I, I, I'm thinking still in terms of um, light and atmosphere. I'm still using my uh, shift in focus. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm looking at this through blurred eyes. And I'm um, kind of erase out some of these lighter areas. So again, one of the things that I mention a lot in this series is that, you know, try to really consider the tools that you have. And as you're using each tool, always be contributing to the form. So, you know, one of the, the things that we we're kind of taught early on when we start to pick up an, er an eraser is that it's meant to just get rid of mistakes. You know, that's when we're writing, you know, we pull out an eraser and we we change the letters, all right, that we that we either miswrote or, you know, we're messy or something. So it's all about typically just getting rid of a mistake. Um, but when you're drawing, the eraser is an opportunity to contribute to the form. It's a, an ability to, to express your observations. Um, so it's, it's a way to think both in terms of positive and negative space there. And so I'm gradually, I'm keep reshaping the kneaded eraser here into these kind of irregular forms. And 
and I'm going to keep working in that sky. And hopefully what I'm kind of conveying in this process too is this uh, it's a process by which you're you know we're, we're constantly adding and then subtracting and refining and reshaping um, rather than finishing as we go Uh, we're, we're constantly adjusting. Uh, observing too on the clouds how, you know, they, they're they lighter on the, the side that, that's facing the, the clouds there. So, so as we come down here, there's a little bit kind of a highlight underneath some of these clouds. And then up in this area, there's just a lot of atmospheric kind of wisps of light as it catches in the clouds. So I'm just kind of intentionally creating softer edges here. So it's just building up, taking down, building up and taking down. It's a very sculptural process. Uh, Patricia, you're asking if I have to clean the eraser before I do those highlights. You're going to get a feel for it as you go along. Um, what I'll do is, I know that this is going to be the hot spot where it's brighter. And as we move out, those lights are going to get less intense. So as, if, I have, if I'm starting with a clean eraser, what I might do is work on the interior section here. And now as I'm doing this, it's picking up charcoal. And, as, uh, and then I know that as I move around to the outer edges, that eraser isn't quite as clean. And so it, it actually will, it'll pull up less charcoal, which is kind of what I want. I want to be able to create a differentiation between that light there and that light there. Just kind of softly transitioning that light there. And then let's see, I'm gonna work on that horizon line a little bit later. There's a, I'm going to add a little bit of structure here along that horizon line. I might just let that be the way it is up here. It's all just kind of loose and suggestive. Um, and I, I think I kind of like that shift where I, I might add more detail in here again than that center of interest. So I'm just kind of reshaping that, that kneaded eraser and starting to suggest some of that form in here. So I'm, I'm moving my eyes very quickly back and forth between the reference photo and the drawing. Um, and I'm trying to create marks that approximate what I'm seeing, but it's, I'm not being too precise with them. As long as they get the general shape, this is a very gestural way of, of working. And one of the things I want to be mindful of as well is that there's a tendency to want to create consistent, even marks. We have, we, we, we generally have this kind of built-in sense of, of rhythm and uh, what I, I have to fight my, myself is this desire to create evenly spaced forms and evenly spaced marks. So as I'm just allowing this pencil, this eraser to kind of, sh kind of skip across the page, it's, I want to be mindful that I'm not creating consistent and even marks throughout the, the whole thing. So I want to be looking at some of these masses to, to look at that the overall um, the rhythm. Is there variation in there? Are they all the same size? Are they evenly spaced? Things like that. Um, because having that variation is what is, is going to bring life to this. And so this, what I'm doing in here, really simulates what I would be doing with a brush. And it's one of the reasons I like working with charcoal, and people have referred to charcoal as more of a painterly medium, because I, I, can, I can think more uh, in terms of, of paint and brushwork uh, with this medium than I can with graphite. So right in here, I'm just using a very light touch and it's blending more than anything. And then if I need to, um, I can press down harder to lift out an area. So pressure control is something that's really helpful. 
Um, somebody's asking a question, is there any advantage to printing the photo in black and white? Would that help clarify the value relationships, especially in the sky? It would, um, but I think for me, that is the challenge here, is to um, specifically try to interpret the value relationships between those colors. Um, the, the best opportunity for me would be to actually work um, on location, but because of the nature of this class, I can't do that. Uh, so the next best thing is for me to work in color and, and try to build that challenge because I want this to be an exercise that's helping me to become a better painter, especially on location. So printing it in black and white, it would lead perhaps to a better drawing result, but the experience itself may not give me the tools I need when I go out and paint. So that's why I have specifically the, um, uh, the, the color, color photograph. And I'm working from a, a digital image versus a printout because that it ultimately is it's even one step closer to working from life than working on the printout. The printout, um, I can never quite get that luminosity that I need. Um, all right, Barbara, you're new. You're sculpt you've been sculpting for years, so that's really fascinating. Welcome to the group, everybody. If you are new and you're joining for the first time, my name is Scott. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network, and we are always welcoming of new viewers and participants. So, um, all right, Pam saying, you printed it out in black and white. I think that, yeah, go right ahead. Um, but again, it's all it all depends on what your objective for this is. Uh, so what I'm doing now is I'm gonna be utilizing my shading stump and I'm gonna to start to put in that horizon line. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm starting with that, there's a um, kind of a defined, um, ridge right here that looks like horse tooth rock if anybody is familiar with uh, northern Colorado up in Fort Collins that's horse tooth rock I'm gonna work out from there and as you can see in the photo where that that Sun is setting it really diffuses that edge and I want to capture that um, that's a, really a visual indicator for the mind when you see that diffused edge that um, there's light happening there so I'm just trying to sharpen up that edge, but I'm not, I'm, again, I'm using the shading stump because it allows me to sneak up on that value and think in terms of shape more effectively than working with the pencil. So as you can see, I haven't even pulled out the pencil yet. I'm gonna get there. But I wanna start to, I'm gonna kind of sneak up on it, kind of working backwards uh, from kind of the typical way of working, which is kind of to, to think about uh, lines first and then filling in. But I think this isn't quite giving me the, um, it's not defining the shape quite like I want to, so I think I'm gonna to shift to my, uh, my charcoal pencil, it's a 4B. I've got it shaved down, I've, I've kind of carved away the casing to expose that core, sanded it down a little bit because I want to be thinking in terms of shape again as much as possible. So I'm utilizing the side of the pencil, thinking from moving up to that horizon line rather than the horizon line down. Because uh, what's going to flatten out that horizon line is if I think, if I create that edge too heavily as a line. Uh, so if I create a heavy line and then fill it in, that line's going to pop to the surface and I'm going to lose that sense of depth. So I'm laying down the charcoal, working my way up to find that horizon line. And then now that I'm depositing charcoal on the paper, when I come back with my, my shading stump, it's going to pick up that charcoal and then I can refine that edge even farther. So this is very much like I would be painting. So if I had a brush in my hand, if this was a brush, I'd be working here, kind of working up to that line and try to keep my head out of that shot as much as possible. Um, and then this is going to go even darker um, as, I, as I go along, but I just want to try to approximate the the forms here, the mountains. Long's Peak is over here. So I'm just trying to, try to map that out a little bit. All right, let's see what happens. I'm gonna shift back to the shading stump. 
kind of just picking up the charcoal and now I'm going to refine that edge. I don't like those marks that I was creating. I was creating these diagonal marks. So I'm going to get rid of those, run these vertically. Now, if I need to, if I, if I want to really get in there and add some detail, I want to be really gentle with the outline. I'm going to smooth that out a little bit, but I want to be gentle with that outline as I create the, uh, the shape of those mountains. Because I, again, I don't want it to be a hard line. And you got to ask yourself, you know, how precise you want to be with these each and in, each and in every kind of individual bump. But you can see as I'm as I'm sharpening up that edge, I want to be mindful of the value uh, that I'm applying because I don't want it to to be a hard line. And I can darken right around in this area here, and it's going to intensify. It's going to intensify that light as I darken this. So I'm just trying to focus a little bit now, so I'm trying to think more specifically about that, the, the lines there. And again, for me, it's a bit more critical that I get this right, because that's, it's, again, it's, like, it's like, a, like drawing a portrait of somebody. The contour, the, the profile of these foothills are unique to this area. You know, and it might be similar, you know, like if you go to, if I go to Montana or or Utah, or some of you might see a scene that's similar to this, but the specific contour, the specific profile um, is, is kind of unique to this, this spot here. And so for me, I want to spend a little bit more time to make sure I'm at least in the ballpark um, so that it reads as this specific spot rather than you know any sort of kind of mountain vista um, sunset. So. But you want to define for yourself how far you want to push that. You know, is this is this about sunsets in general for you? Is this about this specific sunset? Is it about light and shadow? And it can be all of those things. There's no right or wrong answer there. But I think it is helpful to have a clear vision of that so that it feels like a an inten uh, an, an intentional choice rather than kind of defaulting to. Uh, you know, whatever just your hand does. Jabba and Simone, who wants to dance? Everybody should be dancing right now. That sounds awesome. I would not do that. I am far more coordinated with my, with a brush and charcoal <laughs> and with my feet. So I'm not gonna. Um, I'm, not going to have you guys suffer through any sort of dance moves here, but all right. So I'm looking at the profile of Long's Peak here. And if you're not familiar with Long's Peak, that's in Rocky Mountain National Park. It's a, it's a landmark here of Colorado. Haven't been up there for some time, so I'm looking forward to it. So now what I'm going to do Um, I'm going to kind of refine that edge. Again, I want to be mindful not to, not to define that, you know, not to create too hard of a line. But I do want to try to get that generally right. There's a bit of the saddle there. And it's, it's interesting, as you go up and down the front range, the profile of Long's Peak changes. And so the getting that right um, helps me to 
indicate where we are. So somebody might look at this and say, hey, that's, that's Long's Peak. Um, but if you're familiar with the area, then you might indicate, you might recognize this as the view from um, kind of the north side versus, say, Longmont or um, you know, a, an area closer to Denver in the, in the, along the Front Range. Again, that's just kind of me, my, my own um, inclination here. All right. Let's see, and then what I can do, I don't really like this. That's too, too strong. shot a, um, a pastel video with Aaron Schur overlooking Long's Peak. Almost a direct line from where, we're, where the shot was taken, but just up right at the base of the mountain outside of Estes Park. He did a pastel video up there. It was a lot of fun. A place called Wind River Ranch. And the great folks up there to let us on so we could film. So I'm going to let this kind of fade into there. Um, now, one of the things that I also like is, is there's a bit of light kind of striking, kind of peeking through the clouds there right along the horizon. So I can use my kneaded eraser to kind of pick that out. And on the back side of Long's. I don't feel like I really hit that shape properly. But one of the things I liked about this view is the way the, the sun and the mountain kind of balance one another, almost like a yin and a yang. It's all very subtle, but... Um, Kind of liked that, so it's one of the things I was thinking about as I as I was kind of exploring the shot. So all right, just kind of cleaning up some areas along the edge. How's everybody doing? Um, So I got a question here. Are there any other techniques to form clouds without getting the dark shades to interfere in the process when I blend them? I'm not quite sure I understand. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things I, I haven't really done is really rendered the clouds a whole lot. I mean, I think I might go back into some of these areas and pull out some more specific detail. So what I'll do is uh, maybe I'm going to try to come back to that question a little bit. I'm going to think through that. Um, I'm going to think about how to really define the shapes of the clouds. Right now, I'm thinking about them more in terms of abstract shapes. Um, but I, I think it might be helpful to kind of really under, break down the forms a little bit more. So I'm going to try to come back to that, if that's all right. But it's a little little bit different process to drawing than some of the other videos that we've got. Again, because it's it's about this kind of scene rather than a singular object. Um, and I, I think it's kind of a, a, a good challenge for you if you've um, if you've not drawn landscapes much before. Give it a shot. See how it works. Now, one of the things, again, we've, we've kind of talked a bit about before in, in other videos in the series is, you know, are the, are the nature of edges, right? Is, you know, when to provide a sharp edge and when to be kind of softer and more kind of atmospheric. And I think this really helps to confront that issue um, because, um, you know, the, the eye is constantly moving. 
and um, the because it's constantly moving, we're never setting in on anything. We, you know, whenever we're looking at something, you know, we might bring it into focus, but then we're moving to something else. And so there's this, um, there's a, sorry, I'm kind of thinking about, it. I see this kind of tilting of the landscape. I think I need to bring this up a little bit more, but um, we're kind of getting back to the air, the idea of um, kind of focus is that if everything get, is in sharp focus, it can be a little bit jarring to the viewer's eye. Uh, now, having said that, you know I, some of my, you know my, my hero Neil Welliver, he, he would do that a lot. I mean, everything would essentially have the same focus, and that really drew attention to the fact that it was a flat canvas that we're working with, paint on a flat surface, um, and he was able to create depth through um, through very precisely mixed color. Uh, and I, I've always kind of struggled with that. But, you know, one of the things that can, can make it feel more natural to the viewer's eye is to have very specific areas where we have more focus and others where there's less. So it's just kind of something to consider. And then also, you know, we don't necessarily have to have everything line up. You know, it doesn't have to, as I look along, along the horizon line, I could be breaking this up a bit more and the eye naturally fills that together. Let's see, I feel like that's a little bit better. It feels a bit more uh, <laughs> balanced. It was getting a little tilty there. So one of the things I'm doing is, you know, I, can, you can, I have this bar down in here, my wrist is resting on it, and that helps me to understand what um, horizontal is what's parallel with the, the bottom edge of the, the drawing. How are we doing on time? Well, a little over an hour, so we're doing pretty good. Um, so I feel like this has got to come... kind of level out a little bit more here. And I can come back in with this light along the horizon line again. So, and this is exactly what I would have done in the in the painting as well. You know, so if I drew it too low or off center, I kind of push it up, bring bring some areas down. You know, there you you got to rework those areas. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you really don't want to. <laughs> sometimes you need to. Um, I don't know if, if anybody's seen his documentary, but it's by the Spanish realist named Antonio Lopez Garcia. But there's a documentary out there where he's um, he spends all summer long working on a, um, I believe it's a quince tree, and I think that's in the title. Um, and you know, he you, he get through most of the most of the summer, and he's almost done with the painting, and you realize, you know, everything needs to come down an inch. So it basically just repaints everything and just shifts it all down. And you're like, you just spent all summer working on this thing. How could you do that? But he, he, he just needed to. That's, that's what the painting called for. And I look at that and I don't know as if I would have the, um, the strength to be able to do something like that. But it uh, kind of shows you, you know, the, the, the lengths uh, to which you know, some artists will go just to, to keep at a painting to make sure it's right. All right, so as you can see, I've really spent a lot of time on that horizon line. I don't know as if I got it correct, uh, you know, 100%. I, you know, I could probably be spending quite a bit more time really dialing it in, but for the sake of this drawing, I think it's probably good for me to move along and kind of show the kind of the finishing stages. Um, kind of sharpen up some of these edges here. And so as I create a, a sharper line along that horizon line, I want to be careful not to create a hard, consistent edge. You want to, want to break it up, you know, so that it um, has a bit more life to it, a bit more atmosphere. All right, let's see. Now we've got this compressed charcoal. 
and you saw me lay it down earlier, but it's kind of been kind of wa washed away a little bit. So what I'm looking at is that transition from that, those distant mountains, then along the, the plains here. And I'm trying to observe where that is and any kind of subtle indicators of what's happening along that. So there's trees that are coming up there and I'm just gonna suggest them. And what I like about this drawing with a stick rather than the, the pencil is that it gets a, it's a softer, richer charcoal. Um, and it, it lends itself to thinking again in terms of shape and I can suggest the trees more than fully define them. So as I'm thinking, I'm visualizing this path along here, but instead of drawing a singular line, I'm trying to piece it together by, with marks that are running vertically, kind of suggesting some of the trees there. And it's all very dark, so I have a hard time seeing specifically what's happening. And I can let my drawing reflect that observation. I don't need to have everything fully rendered. Sometimes you just can't see something and the drawing can reflect that, that part of the experience. Um, so there are some houses in there too, but I, I can't quite make them out, so I'm not gonna force it. I'm just gonna try to bring some of these marks here out a little bit. But you can see what that did to the value there. That red is really dark, and I could feel myself calibrating to the values there along that horizon line and thinking that's the darkest dark. And then to come back in with something that's even darker, it really pulls that into focus there. Um, and I, it's, it's something that happens in painting as well. Sometimes with color, you'll add like a really rich dark and all of a sudden that color will come to life because it's, it's been given a new context. All right, so I'm just gonna, I think what I wanna do is similar to what I'm doing in the sky, be suggestive of that ground plane. There's a little, there's some texture along here. So I'm just drawing with a whole side of the charcoal, kind of up and down and horizontally to suggest some of that texture in the ground plane so that it doesn't read as just a solid black form. Um, but kind of going back to this choice of charcoal, um, what I love about it is that it it feels like a relationship between me and the materials. And it, it starts to do what it wants to do. I don't have a whole lot of control over this charcoal stick. I, you know, I, I'm kind of letting those marks fall where they fall, seeing what they suggest. And, and if, in, you know, some cases it works, some cases it doesn't. I can move it around with my fingers a bit. You gotta be really careful with this not to breathe in the dust. Um, if I didn't have the need to be able to talk through this, I might actually work with a dust mask just so I'm not breathing that in. All right. Um, now that we have these trees kind of sticking up on the, the left, I'm gonna suggest them. See so what I'll do is I'll use this, this pencil. Um, Try this. So what I'm doing is, is I'm trying to visualize the path and I'm just rolling the pencil with my fingers, taking it on the side and kind of just kind of rolling it and allowing it to skip across the surface rather than trying to draw the tree. I'm trying to look at some more individual shapes and suggest that tree more than anything. And I find using the side of the pencil is a bit more effective than the point. So I'm dragging it along and rolling it. Um, and then th this is directly related to how I would be painting right now. I would be use utilizing the brush in exactly the same way. Rolling the brush, pushing and twisting and pulling rather than kind of than creating defined brush strokes. And so sometimes when I'm, when I'm working this way, I'm, if, if this becomes a preparatory sketch for the painting, then uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, kind of rehearsing the brush marks that I might be making. 
to get a sense for you know how I might want to render that. And then let's see if I've got a rather soft edge along here, I can make it sharp in a few areas, softer in others, maybe let this whole area just kind of blend together. What do I think of that? And that kind of brings light in that center. So just picking up the charcoal on my fingers. Let's see. I'm pretty happy with the values here. Let's see. I'm going to see what happens if I drop in some. Since my, my fingers are loaded with charcoal right now, I'm going to drop some of that in here. Yeah, I can see those distinct fingerprints. It's the oily fingers. So a different way of working than I, I really have in some of the other uh, demonstrations and the other live sessions. There, that, I kind of like that, that value there. It brings a little bit more weight up there. Okay, so I talked about going back into the clouds and refining them a bit more. Um, uh, Patty, you're asking, how long will these classes stay online for our use later? All the videos that we're doing live, they go up as recordings afterwards, and they should stay up there for ever, as far as I know, as long as we have our YouTube channel here on Artist Network. I have no intention of pulling them down. Um, now, the, the page is on the website, though, so if you're following along and you are you're posting your work, um, those should stay up for a long time as well. We don't have any kind of intention to, to pull them down, but... Um, so you can find all of these on artistnetwork.com. You can go to artist, go to the Artist Network YouTube page, and um, uh, subscribe there, and you should be able to see all the videos in the series. We have a playlist for them. All right, so now I'm going back through and I'm looking at the specific shapes of clouds. I think I need to spend a little bit more time in this focal point. I'm capturing, I'm creating that that area of, of interest through value, but. I'd like to add a little bit more detail. So I'm just utilizing the shading stump to add a little bit more form. Uh, now there was a question earlier about rendering clouds. And it's, it, for me, I find it, it, this is when working from the inside out is really helpful uh, because working on the outside in, the, the clouds, all, they have very soft edges. Some of them are more defined than others, um, but you will often, if, especially with some of these, you can see a variation where some of these clouds here have more distinct forms uh, than others. So I want to figure out which clouds have those and start to suggest those. Um, and looking specifically, where are the harder edges? So kind of working my way from the inside, where it's typically a little bit darker because there's it's more dense there, less light is passing through. And as you work your way up to the edges, um, there's a bit more translucency, translucency typically. Now, one of the things that defines a sunset here is that our orientation to the light and shadow flips because typically the, the sun is above the clouds and we see a structure by which there's light on the top of the clouds and it's darker underneath. Um, this is, it's similar to like holding a flashlight up to your face and it gets kind of spooky, right? We're changing the, our relationship and our, our understanding of the basic structure of light and shadow um, by putting that light source underneath. And so that's one of the things I'm looking at right now as well is, um, is part of what defines the, the, the shape of the shadow of the clouds is seeing where those shadows are relative to the light source. Um, OBB is asking about Facebook Live. I'm not going to be doing a Facebook Live tomorrow. Um, I, the next live session will be Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll be doing a live drawing. And uh, the schedule should be up on Artist Network because I cannot remember for life of me what's coming up. I know we have a strawberry coming up soon and a bonfire, which I'm really excited about. All right, so I'm just trying to think through some of the some of the more some of the details here. Now, there's areas where the sky, the blue sky, is darker 
than, than the light clouds. And I can do some negative drawing, for example, in this area and try to sharpen up some of those edges. Try to smooth that out a little bit. So this area now I'm doing the, I'm drawing the blue sky right up to the edge of the clouds. Again, just utilizing the shading stump. Ooh, and I, that, that was kind of weird there. They picked up a chunk of charcoal. That's all right. So I'm just trying to now do some negative drawing, find those some of those harder edges there. And again, there's areas up here where it's a little bit softer and more atmospheric, so I don't need to define edges of clouds. But I think it's, it's helpful as you're draw, dropping in values to be identifying, am I, am I drawing a shadow on a cloud? Am I drawing a blue sky, etc.? because it's really easy to get lost. Uh, Rosalie is asking about fixative to save it. Um, I think especially with charcoal, fixative can be a good idea. Um, uh, uh, storing it flat, you know, I might just put a sheet of glassine on top of it and then stack things on top and try not to move them around much. But, you know, for, for, the, for my purposes, this is really more about the act, the, the act of drawing than the actual drawing. So if this gets all smudged and I'm not worried about it, um, it could get other things all messy though. Um, what I do is I just have these all stacked up in their line and they're all getting kind of ruined if I move them around. But uh, a spray fixative, especially for charcoal, can be effective. But like I said, using a sheet of glassine or something um, can be helpful. Glassine is like a plasticky mylar sheet kind of thing um, that works really well for pastels. Because sometimes with pastels, when you're spray fixing them, it can really adjust the, the contrast. Um, and that, that's something you may notice with the charcoal drawing as well as you use the spray fix that it can sometimes affect the contrast. Sometimes it could be exactly what you want, sometimes not. So, um, yeah. Let's see, somebody's asking, can I do this with pencil crayons? Yeah, you can do this with just about anything. I say, give it a shot. Um, now, this the process that I'm demonstrating is really additive and subtractive which is something that's useful in charcoal. So depending on the materials you're using, you may not be able to um, erase back out. So, uh, If you do have any other questions, though, feel free to type them out all in, in all caps. I'll be able to get to them. I have a feeling I missed a bunch of questions, so I'm sorry if you, you asked something and I didn't quite get to it. Um, I... There, I think there were a bunch of comments that came in and I missed scrolling through them, so I apologize. Um, there we go. But I think we're, we're nearing the end here. I don't know as if I can do a whole lot more to contribute to this drawing. And right now I'm just kind of smoothing this out because I want this to, some of those marks are becoming a little bit distracting. Um, but I feel like it captures it pretty well. Um, I think this, this profile of Long's Peak is always going to bug me <laughs> until I get it absolutely right. But I, I don't know as if you're going to notice much difference as you're following along. So I may sign off in a few minutes. If you have any lingering questions, why don't you call them out now? Um, I'm going to hang on for just a few you know, more seconds because there's a, there's a bit of a delay here. So uh, would I recommend using a white charcoal pencil for these clouds? Um, that, I think it it's definitely worth experimenting with. And what you might try doing is use a separate piece of paper, just do a quick charcoal drawing of, the cl of a cloud, and then adding the white chalk on top of it or a white charcoal on it. Because um, it, one of the things that is going to be distinctive about it is its color temperature. Um, and one of the things you may actually be noticing here is that the vine charcoal and the compressed charcoal and the charcoal pencils all have subtly different temperatures where the compressed charcoal is perhaps the warmest um, and the vine charcoal is perhaps the coolest. The vine charcoal is more of a silvery quality with the compressed charcoal is like this earthy quality to it. Um, 
the white chalk or white charcoal can be very, very cool, which may kind of mix with some of the warmer charcoals and create kind of a muddy color. Um, and also the color of the paper, the tone of the paper may vary as well. And so it may actually be more flat. So check it out, test it out on another piece of paper and see what happens. Um, I've used in some of the other videos, I've used a combination of white charcoal and um, and it, it to, to varying results, varying degrees. I think working on a toned paper, um, working with the white uh, white charcoal on top can be uh, really helpful. It can be a fun exercise. Yeah, I don't want to do this. I'm going to create the suggestion of some of these rays a bit more. So hopefully what I've done is suggested the rays without really over, overly defining them. be able to use the charcoal to sharpen up some of these clouds in here using that shading stump. Just kind of bring bring some of those edges into focus a little bit more let others become more soft and atmospheric. Like right in here I can sharpen up the edge of this cloud. But yeah, I think drawing a drawing a landscape in black and white, intentionally choosing an image that is colored can be uh, a wonderful challenge to try to interpret those subtle value relationships. Um, one of the things that I would do, I taught up at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks when I was a grad student, and there was a, a, a big hall there where uh, they had this red and green carpet. And I would have students go out there and, and draw that red and green carpet. And they, it, it was always a wonderful experience to then see them kind of confront the value relationship between those. Because those red and green is highly visible. Those are complementary colors. You can see those edges very clearly. But when you try to interpret them as values, you realize very quickly that they're the exact same value. So what do you do with that in a drawing? How do you represent a highly contrasting color relationship as value? Um, and that was always kind of interesting to see uh, the different attempts at that. Um, and I don't know as if I had the, the right answer for that, but um, it's, it, that's kind of an extreme example of what uh, working on a, a landscape in color and from a color of reference can, um, can present that challenge. So I think we're just about done here. Okay. Um, love how the foreground brought the landscape to life and given it miles of distance. I use watercolor. Would it be possible after fixing charcoal to add a really watery wash of color? Honestly, I don't know. Um, I have a suspicion that it would not, but I've never used a, a water-based material on top of fixative. But I imagine it would still pull it up, but it could be interesting to turn it into kind of a... Uh, an ink wash drawing. Uh, somebody's, uh, M. Donahue is asking, I still find it difficult using such a, uh, uh, using for such a fine line. A paper quality matters. It does matter to some degree. So a, high, a high, highly textured paper is going to be a little bit more challenging to, uh, in terms of creating a very fine line. Um, but I think that's where I, I, you know, with whatever materials you have, you know, try to exploit its natural tendency. So if it does have a lot of texture, maybe then you, you don't use that line. It becomes about value relationships in that case um, and atmosphere more than anything. Um, I'm glad you all enjoyed it. <laughs> Barb, another great lesson. Ready for a bath? Yeah, I know. This is, uh, I, I learned my lesson when I was washing off yesterday. I got all the charcoal in the sink and then it just smeared the sink and it took me forever to kind of wash that out. So, 
Uh, I apologize for all of you that now may have a mess on your hands, <laughs> literally a mess on your hands. So, um, uh, workable fixative, JC is asking. Workable fixative, I think, is uh, I've never really had much luck reworking a drawing after using workable fixative. Um, it, but that's it's honestly it's been years since I've tried it, so I don't know if formulas have changed since uh, since I last tried it. So um, I, typically, once a layer of fix is done, then you might be able to add to it, but subtracting could be a challenge. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, you know, like if you know if I if I spray fix this right now, I I wouldn't be able to race down to that bright white again, but I could add areas that are darker on top of it if that makes sense, so. Um, yeah, oh, JC is asking, yeah, try using water-soluble graphite. I've never done that, but I've seen some amazing work. I think Dan Marshall, he's down in, in uh, Denver, he's a watercolorist, I think he's done some work with that lately. Um, yeah, check out some artists that are posting some of those. That's That looks like a lot of fun. And I know um, uh, Savoir Faire, they were making a, a, a pencil that could you could lay down and then add a brush on top of it. It was really, it's really cool stuff. Um, so thank you all. I'm not seeing any. Um, oh, Irene, couldn't figure out where to post a dog last week. Um, let me look into that. I don't know. I don't know if that page was actually linked to or not. Um, but if you go to artistnetwork.com, at the top of the page, you'll see drawing together. Click on that, and you should see a list of all the classes. Hopefully, the one for the dog is posted there. And if you click on that, it should bring up the page. But it may it may not have been created quite yet. So let me look into that. You might have to come back a little bit later. Um, and also, when you post onto the websites there, they, those comments need to be approved. And I tried to do my best to get in there right away to approve them. So I apologize for some of you have had to wait for a while for them to show up. So. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, Irene, I'll, we'll try to get that figured out right away. Um, to try to get you post, get that posted. I'm not again. I'm not quite sure if that that page was was created um, yet. So you might it might just be a, a a little while. Oh, I meant the eraser for thin line. M. Donahue's. Let's see. Um, excellent here. Uh, let me think about M. Donahue about using the eraser for the thin lines. Yeah, it's. Um, you're talking about erasing up to find that edge. Um, if, yeah, the textured paper makes it really difficult to kind of erase back and really kind of sharpen up that edge kind of like along this edge line here. Um, so I, I like this paper. What am I using? I'm using, um, this is the paper I'm using right now. Um, and it seems to be working really well um, for charcoal. It's a really smooth paper, which is not common. Um, for it to work well with charcoal in that often a smooth paper will just hold the charcoal. <laughs> it'll just like, it'll kind of just, hold, it'll just stain it essentially. Um, but this allows me to erase back to that bright white pretty easily. Um, so I really like that. Um, and then Lynn D, you're asking about, can you see the post of others? So if you can go, there's a link in the description below that'll take you to the Drawing Together page. And from there, you'll be able to find all the other episodes. Each episode has its own show page um, where you'll see the video as well as the, the discussion field where people have been posting their work. So um, Barb is uh, asking, what do you think of mono pencil? I don't know what that is. Let's see. Oh yeah, that, that's right. I did the dog on Facebook and I don't know if we created that page. So let me look into that. So people are asking about the, the page um, where people can sub, uh, post their drawings. And that's right, I did, we did that, that um, demo on Facebook and I don't know as if we actually created a show page for it. Um, so I'll look under our team, I'll connect with our team here about that page. So I think we just need to provide that link to it, so. Um, all right, so I think it's come in. I think everybody's pe uh, questions are in. I'm glad you all joined me for today. It was a blast. Thank you all. Um, happy with how it turned out. I think it captures the sunlight pretty well. Um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free once the video goes up. 
Um, it's going to go up as a recording. I like to check that um, discussion feed. So if I missed anything here, feel free to post there, there and I'm going to try to get back to you. So thank you all. I will see you all on Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, I look forward to seeing you then. And we may hopefully try to shift gears. I've been working with charcoal for a while, um, but I need, to, I need to look at that subject and see what material is most appropriate for it. So thank you so much. I, again, as always, I appreciate all the positive comments, all the suggestions. Um, you guys are a wonderful community, so I appreciate it. Thank you. See you all Wednesday.